Hello Legends. In this video, I'm going to show you how to service multiple clients off of one NAN workflow. And the whole idea here is that if you've got a productized service, um, every time you get a new customer, you typically have to duplicate your entire workflow. Um, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to take one workflow and actually service multiple customers. So let's say you have something like a speed to lead system where for every new form submission, you take the customer details and then you put them into your AI system, which could be a retail agent. Uh, which calls the customer, uses NAN as a back-end service and maybe some other services as well, and then has a conversation and eventually delivers a new lead to your client. So in this setup, if you were to get a new client, what you typically have to do is take this entire thing and then duplicate it, and then go into this duplicated version and then remove out all the previous variables, insert the new customized variables, the personalized stuff, um, and then basically fire off this workflow. And now you have two clients and you have two workflows. Now, if you wanted to uh, pick up another client, once again, you've got to duplicate, come into this third workflow, and then you know, edit everything to make it personalized. And then every time you get a new client, you have to keep duplicating and duplicating. So um, the benefit here is that this is initially a very easy way to start scaling your business. Because when you have your first client, you're not sure if you can get a second one. When a second one comes onto that service, then you get the third and then you get the fourth. And then eventually you find that um, when you have four workflows, 10, 20, 30 workflows to manage, things get pretty cumbersome. So if you ever have to make an update to one of the workflows, you can't just make one update and it proliferates across to all the workflows. You've actually got to go into every single NAN workflow um, and make that minor adjustment, save it, redeploy it, go into the second one, third one, 10th one, 20 one. So then very quickly you start to see that managing multiple workflows is not entirely scalable. Um, and if you keep doing this specific way, then you're gonna to have to hire someone else just to manage all these workflows. So then our problem statement is that uh, for every new client that we get, we've got to duplicate everything. We've got to go in and personalize everything. Every change we need to make, every update we need to make, we have to go into all those different workflows. So the issue is that actually more workflows does equal more problems over the long term. And then the solution is on the other side of the coin is, well, okay, how do we actually just use one workflow to service many clients? So a very simple way to approach this is, let's just assume we're focusing on this NAN uh, backend service for your retail agent. So what we do is we build one core workflow where throughout the actual workflow itself for all the key nodes like the AI agent step, we're not hard coding any prompts. We're not hard coding any um, actual variables. We're just using placeholder variables throughout the entire workflow. So that when we start the workflow and it's triggered by a tool call from the retail agent, or we might be using SMS speed to lead directly plugging into NAN or some other workflow, we first hit off into our client database. And then in our client database, we literally list all the clients that we currently have on that specific service. And then since we've put all dynamic variables into our workflow, we just set the variables here. So every time you add a new client, you just choose which AI model we're using. What's the prompt for the client? Um, and then these two sections I'll show you in a second, they're very cool as well. But this means that every time you wanna actually add a new client to this workflow, to the system that you have, you can just go Ben's Butchers, you choose three, you might say reply in five words, and then you just set the rest of the variables in this database and then you're done. And that client is literally onboarded onto your new system. That's how easy it is. So coming back to our Miro board, we start the workflow, we go across to the client database, we search up the client, we bring in those variables onto our uh, workflow, and we'll just take them out of the database, and then we have a set fields block, and we set those uh, variables into the placeholders that we're using for the workflow, which means as we're going through, we're just using those variables, we're inserting them into the appropriate steps. And that means that this specific execution, since we're using those personalized variables, the execution is personalized to the client. So without these variables, the actual workflow itself is like a generic um, template workflow. But as soon as you apply specific clients variables into here, uh, it's personalized for them. So one thing that I found for myself is um, the majority of my clients will just use one core workflow. Um, there's a section of clients that have upgraded and they might be paying me a little bit more. Um, and for those clients, they use the same primary workflow, but they have some additional routing, some additional processing. So I still don't want to manage even three workflows, even if there's like three variations. I just want one core workflow and I want to do all the heavy lifting from the database. Like if I need to set some additional variables here, if I need to upgrade someone to have some additional sections, I can do it here. So in this part over here, we have section one and section two. Um, I've got false, false and true, false. So we're going to be actually testing both these uh, clients. We're going to run some payloads through our NAN workflow to show you how this looks. But at a high level, if I've got false and false, that means as I execute this workflow, I come into the workflow, I'm executing all the regular standard steps. Now, instead of going into this bottom section here, since I've said false, I'm bypassing this. And I said false, and I'm bypassing this as well. So this is like my core route where 80% of my clients are using. And let's say for my second uh, client, which is Stacy's Florist, 
she actually uses the first section, but not the second section. So this means we come in with a payload, we get Stacy's information, we put all the custom variables into our workflow. And now since we are using the section one processing, we're coming to section one, we process, we come back up to this if statement here, and then we're not using section two. So we just bypass section two and we complete the workflow. So by now you're starting to see the power of a really good database. Um, this is a very simple database. I've just got one sheet for all my clients. And for this workflow, I've just got, you know, four different custom variables that we're bringing into the workflow. But as we saw before with Ben's butchers, all I had to do was just spend 30 seconds putting all the variables into here. And then I just have one core workflow to maintain. So the beautiful thing is with these sections, like let's say, for example, I want to um, get Bart's Automotive. And now Bart's Automotive wants to have that additional processing for section one. If I want to upgrade them to the next tier and maybe they're paying me instead of 250 bucks a month, they pay me 500 bucks a month. I can just come into here and change this to true and now they've been upgraded. So it's actually very easy to manage upgrades, to manage new clients, to remove clients from this workflow as well. You don't actually have to leave this database to do any manual cleanup. And then like we spoke about before, since we only have one workflow, if I ever have to make a change and I wanna change the database that I'm using, for example, I just have to come into here, choose my new database, and then it literally proliferates for all the different clients that I have. So now I actually wanna run some API calls to hit that NAN workflow. I've got three different payloads I'm gonna be sending. I'm gonna send this first payload for Bart's Automotive. I'm sending in a message of, hi, how are you? And I'm sending the identifier of Bart's Automotive, which is literally just the client's name over here. So let's just start this workflow. I'm gonna click on execute. And now I'm just gonna fire off this API call. It's gonna go node and webhook. Now I wrote this API call using the cursor AI assistant. So on the right hand side, there's a tab where you have an AI assistant. Um, I just sent it my webhook endpoint for NAN. And I said, hey, I want this kind of payload to go across to my assistant. This is very frequently how I test some of my webhooks and my actual workflows. So um, yeah, we're gonna to go to the NAN canvas in a second, but we essentially sent in a message of, hi, how are you? and the identifier of Bart's Automotive. And a response here is, hello, how can I assist you with your automotive needs today? So back on a canvas, you can see that we came in with our webhook and we didn't take any of these additional routes. Now let's have a look at how this was fired off. So our webhook received the information from Cursor, which is just an API call that we made. We have the message of, hi, how are you? And the identifier of Bart's Automotive. So our very next step was to go across to our database and our database is using the filter of the actual client name. And thankfully in Cursor, we were able to actually send this identifier across and we pulled up this information. So we're using model one, we're using this specific prompt for Bart's Automotive and section one is false and section two is false. So now since we have all these variables, we're just mapping them to the placeholders for our workflow. Uh, the prompt is mapped to prompt, the LLM model that we're using is mapped to LLM and then section one and section two for those additional routes. So now come back onto the canvas. And now in our AI agent node, we can just open up the system message and literally that variable prompt that we had from Google Sheets from our database was inserted into here. So you're a helpful assistant for Bart's Automotive, you respond in short and concise messages. So now when we actually process this request, which we actually got from our webhook as well, so hi, how are you? Which is the message that we sent in our initial payload. We had that custom message processed against our variable prompt and we chose uh, OpenAI over here for our model selector. So we just had the condition of if the LLM variable equals to one, we use model one. If it equals two, use model two and three equals uh, uses model three. So, I mean, I just put this here because sometimes you might find for different clients for different use cases, um, the prompt works differently for different LLMs. So this is just a different way to actually make your entire system even more dynamic because you have these additional selectors. So after we process through the AI agent step, we come into this if condition where we're just pulling in the section one and section two variables, which are both false for this specific client. Um, and we just bypass. So as you can see here, we didn't go into this additional processing. We just fully bypassed it. And same thing for this next if statement, we had uh, section two equals to false. So we just bypass as well. And then we had a response sent back to uh, our invoking API call, which in this case was cursor. So we just had a look at Bart's Automotive where both routes were false. Now we're gonna fire off Stacy's Florist where she actually uses the additional processing means that we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be taking this section one and then just bypassing section two. So let's start this workflow, go back into cursor. I'm going to comment this out, which means we're not going to be using this payload. And now we're using payload two for Stacy. And we're sending across, hi, my name is Bart and I want roses. And then the identifier is Stacy's florist. So same thing as before, node webhook. And uh, once it's processed, we're going to get a response here in just a second. Awesome. So hello, Bart. Great choice with the roses. They're always beautiful. And then looking at the NAN execution, we took the regular route and then we came in for the additional processing for section one. We can see it's highlighted green. And then we took the uh, 
not the additional section for section two. So that means we had true over here, then we had false over here. Now going back to the uh, client database. So what did we get here? We mapped in Stacy's florist and we pulled in her variables, which is the custom model, the prompt, and then section one is true and section two is false. So that means Stacy might be on a higher tier and she might get some additional service. And then for the execution with the AI agent, we actually use the model number two, which is the Anthropic. But since this information extractor from the additional section one uses an LLM, I just plugged it into OpenAI. So that's why both these models are actually highlighted green. Now over here for the additional processing, we have an information extractor. And this is just a random generic functionality, but out of the inbound message that we had, which is, hi, my name is Bart and I want roses. That was the payload that we had from Cursor. I'm just extracting the name of the person and what flowers they wanted. And then I have this um, object over here, which is name Bart and flowers roses. And what I'm doing next is just plugging that into a very simple Gmail API call. So I'm just saying, um, hey, you've got a new inquiry. This is the customer's name. This is the flowers that they want. And the conversation is ongoing. So this is a really just a generic step to showcase this additional functionality. And here's that inquiry in our inbox. You have a new inquiry, customer name Bart, type is roses and conversations ongoing. And then finally, we took this uh, regular route over here, and then we had the response back to our invoking API call. And yeah, that was cursor. So for these two examples, um, what you might notice is that since we're controlling the API call, we're actually able to send this uh, unique identifier. So we had Bart's Automotive and an identifier here was Stacy's Florist. So this kind of approach even works when you're creating custom functions for your other AI tools. Like if I'm across in retail AI and I go to add, I can add a custom function and actually over here, I can define some of the parameters that I want to send across. So one of those parameters would be identifier and then, you know, Bart's automotive motive. And uh, when this API call is sent, uh, it's also going to include this identifier. And then in my uh, entrance to this workflow, I would just pick it up from the webhook and plug it into my database. But in cases where you don't actually control how you're setting up these parameters, for example, if you've built out a um, like an AI SMS system, which is still speed to lead, but now instead of doing an AI caller, you're just texting with the customer. Well, in that case, uh, typically, if you're using something like Twilio, you don't really get control over what the payload is that you're sending across to your instance. So in that case, you, um, you have to be a little bit more clever, but the same approach applies. So in Twilio, if you've ever been using the system, um, you can inspect the inbound payload that you get, and it typically contains the actual message itself from the user. It includes the from phone number, which is just the user's phone number, and then the to phone number, which is the business phone number. So in this case, the same thing as if we were to use identifier as Stacy's florist or identifier as Bart's automotive, the two phone number is always static for the business or for the team. Like if you've got a really big business, you might have one phone number for the sales department, one phone number for the customer support department. So you can very easily just pick out that phone number and then plug it into your database to use as the unique identifier. Now, outside of Twilio, if you're using something like Zendesk or HubSpot or Stripe, and there is no like to or from phone number to use, uh, each of these services also, like they will always use um, in the payload that you get in your NAN, they're always going to use like the account ID or an account identifier, which you can just use that to map your um, actual client to. So it doesn't really matter if it's a name, if it's the two phone number, if it's a, an actual account ID or whatever you're using, you just need to map it appropriately or you just need to structure it properly in your database. And then when you use your API call to go and retrieve these variables, um, you just use that to filter out the results. So in our case, we have the two phone number. I'm just going to add this to the database. So I'm going to go into here and I'm going to plug this like this. So now we have a new client and I'm just going to copy these things across. So we're going to use this new client is going to use the third model. It's going to reply in five words and let's just go false and false. And now we've got a new client added to our, uh, to our system. So the only adjustment I need to do is in our case here, we sent these two variables in the payload. The second variable was my actual identifier. Um, now I'm sending three. So the third variable is the identifier. So I've just got to switch up over here how I'm actually pulling that out. So as we can see, I'm expecting json.body.identifier and we get Stacy's florist, which is over here, dot identifier. But in our case, we've got to go dot two. So I'm just going to change this dot two. Now I'm changing this for this demonstration, but um, when you build your workflow, since you're going to have one format, like one type of uh, payload format, you don't have to make this change for every client. This is just for demonstration. So I'm going to go to execute workflow. Let's go back into cursor. And now since we've commented out payloads one and two, we're not going to be getting any messages for these guys. We're just going to be using this new client that we just added for payload three. So I'm going to go node webhook and fire it off. Nice. And here's our response. So we've got, I'm doing well, thanks. So back in NAN, let's see the execution. So um, as we had to, we had to change the actual formatting of how we're parsing the inbound payload. 
we grabbed the phone number, we searched it up, we got all those dynamic variables. So we had model three, reply in five words and false and false. And then they just literally were plugged into the um, automation, into the workflow themselves. So we had model three over here, which is the Google LLM. We had the prompt inserted, which is reply in five words. The same thing over here, hi, how are you for our inbound payload? And then we didn't have any additional routing over here. So then this client's on the standard workflow. So one final thing I'll say is that in a recent video, I put out a template about how to build production ready workflows. Um, I'm not really following any of the best practices here. This is more so to show you the idea of how to scale your agency um, without actually scaling your overhead. But the cool thing is since we're running just one workflow, we can log all the key events from this workflow into one primary database. So I'm gonna link that video below, but you can go ahead and watch it. And I speak about the concept of actually um, being able to monitor like uh, lots of workflows. Um, in this case, since we have one workflow across 10, 20, 30 clients, we can still log all the different outputs, um, the performance, the API costs, um, if anything fails and we have to fa like handle any uh, failures gracefully, we can literally plug all those into one database as well. So then not only do you have one client database that has all the client information, but you can just create a brand new database or a brand new sheet. And then you can very easily just log all the events out of there as well. So then what you might do is on a Friday, you might go to across to your executions logs and you might just spend half an hour going through all the executions, seeing what worked, what didn't, what failed, if the API costs are going up or down so that you can keep a finger on a pulse of all your clients. Now, I don't think you actually need the template for this workflow, um, but I am going to post it up in my school community. Actually, there's a couple of school members that are running a similar system like this. And they were asking about like, what are some ways that we can scale the agency um, without scaling our operations? So if you did want to get any of these resources, uh, including the workflow, and I'm going to put the cursor code up there as well, so you can actually um, test this out for yourself using some dummy data. Um, but if you do want to get these resources or if you want to meet some other like-minded people to yourself who are looking to do these probably a little bit more advanced things for their agency, feel free to come into the school community and have a chat. All right, guys, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.